we were engineering the designs in a sense and un- and aware of what was emerging. Episode 137. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking to Matthew Dearlove, who is the Head of Design of Greenwich Peninsula at Night Dragon, the development company. And we had a really fascinating conversation and Matthew's career is really interesting. He started off as an architect and is still registered as an architect. He was trained at Cambridge and the Royal College of Art. He's worked internationally. He worked for a brief period at Robert Stern Architects. He was a research associate at Helen Hamlin Research Centre. He's worked for Dematos Story Ryan and Nushka Hempel Design. Um, He's also founded his own company called Blockwork, which he's been running for, uh, for, for a number of years. And most recently, he has transitioned his career from the design aspects over into the role of working with developers and really kind of almost being like a translator between the value of good high quality design and public space and how that can be translated into financial and business gains for developer clients and Night Dragon is a really kind of forward thinking development company that kind of has a reverence for design and a deep understanding of the craft um, and their new project design district which is located on the Greenwich Peninsula um, has involved a number of high caliber architects and in this episode Matthew discusses his career how he moved over from architect into this role head of design at a developers how he is able to navigate those conversations between design and business and the work behind design D- district how that has been conceived as a major development how it's working how it's going to be working financially how they structured the appointment process, how they came to chose the architects, how they've been working with the designers to create a very unique location in London and its metrics for success. So sit back, relax and enjoy Matthew Dearlove. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Matthew, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Very good. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Now, I'm very excited to be speaking with you. You've had a really fascinating career. Um, You started off as an architect, working in architecture. Um, You've worked at some really impressive practices. You've had a, you had a a stint I saw at Robert Stern as well in the US. I did. I did in the States, in New York, yes. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah. And then, and then you worked at Anushka Hempel, and more more recently, you've transitioned, or not so that recently, but you've you've transitioned over into the world of development, and mm. are now the head of design um, of Design District, the Greenwich Peninsula Developments uh, with Knight Dragon. So, welcome to the show. Um, fascinating career. How how did this transition occur? Was this a conscious thing? Um, no, I think it's, it's one of those things. I don't think it was particularly planned. It's, it's, uh, you, I think I'd sort of fell into it. Um, I guess my, my background is probably the sort of the standard architectural, uh, career. Did my part one and work experience part two, uh, and then went out into, into practice, um, doing a whole variety of, of weird and wonderful projects from, I think the first project I ever worked on was an equine swimming pool uh, <laughs> for Shartin Racecourse in Hong Kong. Uh, so specifying uh, non-slip tiles for hooves. Uh, <laughs> that was quite an interesting one. Uh, through to, I think my first big project was Cowley Manor Hotel with Dematos Story Ryan um, in Gloucestershire. 
uh, which was converting a, an old manor house into 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 a, a small countryside hotel. Mm. And then I kind of went to uh, I worked briefly in the states. Um, had a very brief work experience at Hopkins. Fell into primarily hospitality for a while, uh, like you say, Anushka Hempel. Um, and then I think Studio Reed. Um, that was working in often in, in the Middle East. Uh, again on hospitality and uh, residential projects. Mm. Um, and actually the thing that probably uh, sowed at the seed of a different path uh, as I was going through sort of architecture sort of school and, and, and work was that after I graduated from the Royal College of Art, I spent a year at the Helen Hamlin Research Centre. Uh, and so that was, that was part-time and I think I was working uh, with Anushka Hempel. Uh, I was also doing um, a, a research project into the role of, of street lighting in urban regeneration. Yeah, uh, And that really led me into doing a lot of work on uh, community consultation and community engagement. Uh, and so I developed an interest uh, in that uh, and how I could apply it to, to work. Now, I guess when you're working on hospitality projects, uh, it, it didn't necessarily marry up with um, with what I was doing uh, at the at the research centre, but then uh, at the time, so I guess this was um, probably early two thousands, two thousand maybe two thousand three. Yeah. There was uh, uh, a program run by uh, Nesta, the National Endowments for Science, Technology, and Arts, and they did this brilliant thing called the Creative Pioneer Academy, where you could take a an academic idea and try and turn it into uh, a business and a business concept and apply for a grant. I think at the time was 35,000 pounds to start up a company. Right. So I took this idea of community consultation uh, that I was working on and how I could sort of sell it as a service to developers or architects to kind of help run kind of community engagement to improve the chances of planning and so on. Uh, and, uh, and I was lucky enough at the end of that program to get funding so I, and I set up a, a small business called Blockwork, uh, Block without a K. So I think it was a riff at the time on that band. Yeah, it was Block Party. So I thought, yeah. oh, Blockwork, that's a good idea. So, uh, <laughs> actually, it was a nightmare because no one could ever spell it um, properly. Um, but so I ran that for actually for a couple of years. And again, I was still working, uh, I think at the time, with Anushka Hempel. Uh, and, um, and actually... It worked quite well. I did I did quite a few educational projects, and actually then the crash happened, and so I went back into kind of full time. But that whole that little sort of period I think was was quite interesting because it it really gave me exposure to business and running an, a, an office and doing accounts and and thinking about all these things that I hadn't really been exposed to in practice, mm. and I think gave me an appetite for doing something that wasn't necessarily standard architectural practice and, and doing drawings and, and sort of delivering buildings, just for sort of stuff that sort of was around the edges yeah. uh, of, of that. Um, and then about 10 years ago, uh, so, I mean, I guess in a sense, I, 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 I worked on quite a few buildings and, and, and delivered a series of, but I didn't think it was necessarily the thing that I was, I was best at. Uh, I certainly wasn't, you know, the, the, the guy who was brilliant at sort of putting together a big drawing package and, and, and being a kind of the sort of technical architect. Yeah. And there was a role that kind of came up, which I was interested in, which was at Beyond, a company called Beyond Green. And it was set up by the ex-chief exec of Greenpeace uh, UK, a guy called Jonathan Smales, who was interested in looking at sustainable development uh, and was very much, although it, our agenda was about promoting sustainability in the built environment, he was very much pro-growth, pro-density, uh, really wanted to tackle all the issues surrounding uh, uh, urban growth uh, uh, and, and making good neighbourhoods. Uh, and uh, I was lucky enough to apply for that role, uh, which was, I think it was sort of a, a creative director or a kind of creative role. And that was really looking at everything from the branding of, of the work, as well as then really getting stuck into a, a master plan project, which was in Norwich. Uh, uh, on the edge of Norwich, three and a half thousand homes. So we used to work on sort of strategic sites. And at the time we were funded by Development Securities, who are now uh, you and I. Uh, and we would look at strategic land projects 
in sort of provincial cities. So we had a scheme in Reading, one in on the edge of, of, of Norwich and Broadland, and, and looking at working with landowners to promote their land, pull a master plan together, get it through planning, uh, uh, which we did successfully uh, in, in Norwich, uh, or in Broadland rather. And um, at the same time, we also did a lot of consulting. Um, we worked with the likes of, of Argent, Grosvenor, uh, Capital and Counties on Else Court, providing sustainability advice and looking at how they could implement sustainability strategies for their projects. So uh, promoting cycling, walking, uh, looking, we used to rely a lot on, we worked with Jan Gale in Copenhagen. And so we used to rely, rely a lot on his thinking, you know, the idea that looking at the spaces in between buildings and making these moves that why wouldn't you do these things? Because they would add value to, to your neighborhood. They would add value to your project and they were good things to do for the environment. And they hopefully created an opportunity for people to tackle the sort of the, uh, the way that they lived in a city and the, the way they could look at their carbon footprint. Um, so, so that, that so sort of so sowed the seed. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. So there's a lot of um, kind of, you know, good, good design principles here <clears throat> and you're, you're kind of negotiating them into landowners projects and kind of helping them develop a business agenda around good design, essentially. Yeah. And I think, yes. I mean, and I think, I guess it was really interesting working in that business early on because what Jonathan was really good at, and I guess that's his background in Greenpeace was he, he was a campaigner. Uh, and so what, what we were able to do, and I think sometimes it's challenging for architects, you know, that they'll present a project and a present a design, which is based on, on some really good principles around, uh, urban movement or around um, uh, I don't, you know sustainable you know sustainable um, materials or whatever it's it's got an agenda which is trying to capture uh, you know good principles and bring them forward. But I think that often what's not really shared from a from a client side with an architect will be some of the the kind of commercial levers behind a project. You know mm -hmm. they're sort of they're well guarded and so they're not going to Kind of, kind of let let the design team in on those, uh, and so we were really trying to sort of understand what things were driving our uh, well, we were consultants in that sense. So what what was what was driving them as uh, our clients to sort of do good work? And I think you know Argent's a good example in the sense that they had you know uh, done this document which was called um, Principles of a Human City. They sort of set out a series of of things that they wanted to do at King's Cross. And so we, when we were working with them, we kept asking them, have you delivered on these? What's your, you know, how have you, um, you know, tracked and catalogued the things that you set out at the beginning and do you feel you've delivered on those principles? And at the time we did a kind of audit, a, a, a audit for them as to whether they felt they'd achieved that. And, and at Earl's Court, we were doing it in, in a, feeding that into a, a planning application whereby we were saying, right, how do we, embed this in your sustainability strategy as mm. part of your master plan? And how do you then provide the tools for the team, your development managers to sort of say, right, I, I have to benchmark this, I have to value this. It's not all just about bottom line. It's not all about making that spreadsheet work. I have to have ways through the process of asking questions and trying to track the, the principles, the vision that was set out is still there at the end. And I think, it's, that's often a really challenging thing to do within development. Um, and often I think the things, you know, the things that we talk about, if you go back to something like Jan Gale's work, and, uh, and actually we now work with two of his ex-directors here at Night Dragon, uh, a company called Schultzer and Grassoff, who are the Danish landscape uh, design business. But often those things that give you the, the sort of the grain of a city, that quality of space, they're really hard to, to track. They're hard to put in a spreadsheet. They're hard yeah. to sort of say, uh, you know, oh, yeah, that's easy. I've ticked that box. Uh, and they're, they're sort of slightly intangible things about quality of light, the right, the way the sun falls on the right space or, or the right bench, so that, that that's the sort of corner of the square to occupy, that there's a sort of a threshold to a building, which is great for a pot plant. I, they, those are the moments that, that give you, the, the, the sort of quality of space that people like and they're very hard I think when you're under pressure as a development team to kind of understand that those are the things that you mm. 
you, you want to try and capture and, and convince, you know, whether it's a client or an investor, that there's value in that. Don't value engineer it out, you know, value engineer it up. You know, yes. you've got to, and that's so you, you keep those moments. Um, and so, and in a way, that's part of how I've fallen in. So after Beyond Green, uh, so I was there for about five years or so, I, I now have a role at, at Night Dragon. Uh, so just before we, you, yeah. just, before, just before you go on to yeah. that, you, you just mentioned, you know, cause that's really, again, really, really interesting about the kind of, um, the things that you don't want to be value engineering out of projects. And mm-hmm. you were saying that some of the developer projects or people like people like Argent, you're kind of getting, you're trying to understand what the commercial levers are, which mm-hmm. they often won't tell the design team. What are some of those? Do you have any examples of those, of those sorts of commercial levers that often are hidden from design teams? I think. I don't think it's necessarily it, it's that it's something that's hidden, but I think it's about uh, you know there'll be a, there'll be a commercial appraisal behind the project which right. will have a load of drivers which are not to do with design. You know, I think uh, as a design team you come at it going right, we're designing the building, we're doing, you know that this is where the we are, and we're the sort of we're the top dogs in the process because this is you know we're delivering. The project, the whole thing, you know, this is the this is a, the, the the beautiful piece of architecture that's going to going to be for this amazing thing for a project. And but behind the scenes, you know, you'll be dealing with the, the client will be dealing with you know the land price, the infrastructure. Uh, there'll be the negotiations with the council and the you know the, the contributions to the local council. There'll be uh, on a on a on a sort of wider scheme. There'll be thinking about the estate service charges, thinking about the long-term maintenance of materials of the public realm and how that feeds into a commercial plan that might be you know, 20, 30, 50 years. And all of those things carry a cost. And then, you, mm. you know, when, you're, when we're working on these, like, wow, that's, you know, that's a lot of money. That's, and so suddenly when, when, you're, when you're looking at a project like that, what happens is you start to sort of say, well, if we, if we can make a saving here and if we can do a little bit here and a little bit here and, it, and you start to tweak the project and it starts to make more sense financially. It's, or, but, but often those moves, which can seem very small in terms of, you know, literally uh, it might be 50p a square foot or something. Mm. Actually, when that's translated back into the design, it can carry a really big, you know, it can make a big difference, especially across a, a large scheme. And so I think it's about, uh, so that in a way that's sort of, that's one, that's a, that's a language that's being spoken by the client, which is not a language that's necessarily passed on clearly to the design team. Yeah. Uh, and so the design team are given a brief and then, you know, we'll say, oh, actually, maybe just that's, that's, sort of, that's a bit challenging. Maybe you need to tweak that. Or, um, you know, when we said this, actually, I think we, we probably meant that. Uh, without being clear as to say, why those decisions are being made, right? Uh, yeah. What is driving that? You know, and it might be that well, we're changing this material uh, on a facade because it's about the long-term maintenance cost uh, of, of this. Or, and often I think what you're doing is you're 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 looking at something, and you might be making a saving elsewhere, but then the designer has to pay for it. And I, and I think so. Those conversations that happen in, internally are not necessarily shared with the design team or an architect or, you know, so, so it, it becomes, I think then it's difficult for an architect to respond to those because I'm thinking, oh, well, why have they changed their mind on that? Or, so it's not that it's, it's not that things aren't shared. I think it's just that you have these different conversations. You know, we often talk in the, in the, I think the industry and the business, you know, about people working in silos. Yes. And I think it's because they're so driven to do the thing that they're focused on, that often it's difficult to share that information or they think they can't. Mm. And so it's trying to find that I guess that's in a sense my role within the company I'm in now, within Night Dragon, is to try and sit between. So although I'm I'm although I say I am an architect in in that in my training uh and I'm still registered, uh, you know, uh, it it means that I can try and and I sit on both sides of the fence. So I sit with the development team, I sit with the planning team, I sit with the estates and, the, and, you know, and, and we're able to sort of pick up on the things that are happening. And I try and make sure we feed that back into the design process. And so what I try and do is, trans, is be a sort of translator 
uh, yes. and at sometimes a bit of a diplomat and trying to kind of make sure that uh, we translate those things that are going on that that I find a way of explaining that you know the the pressures on a project so that we don't lose the moments that I think are, are precious from a design perspective or that I think will add value mm. because the conversations around the you know finances might mean well let's just take that out it's like, no that is you know it might seem the simple thing that is the that's the special moment that's right. you know that's the bench and the sunny spot that's what's that's what's going to give it character um so I think, yeah, it's sort of a bit of a rambling way of trying to of trying to say it. So I don't, it's it's everyone's trying to do. I think you know often, I think often also you feel that the teams are sort of pitted against each other. And yeah. I think really it's just about people. You know, I think at Night Dragon, everyone's invested in in doing the best possible place, but they're they're trying to do it through their own lens. And so you're coming at it from different directions. You're still trying to build the best place you possibly can under the constraints of, of a budget or under the constraints of the sales price of apartments or under the constraints of the local politics or whatever those things are. So people are coming at it from a good place, but they don't necessarily know how to, how to sort of find a common language that's really going to pull people in the same mm. direction. So, um, so with, with your role now at, uh, at Night Dragon, um, how, did that, how did that role begin? How did you how did you end up um, working for Night Dragon? So, Night Dragon is um, we we're, we're we're a developer on a single site, so we have um, a hundred and fifty acre site in Zone Two in London. We are next to people will know the Greenwich Peninsula best for the O2, um, but we are. I think the largest regeneration site under, under single ownership, certainly in London, uh, possibly in the UK. Uh, so we're building 15,000 homes. Um, we, it's a project that, I've, you know, is probably a 20, 25 year project. We are uh, well underway. I mean, the site is, uh, we have an Allies and Morrison master plan uh, for the site, which was uh, completed in, or we got approval for, I think in 2017, it was submitted in 2015. Prior to that, there was a, a, uh, a master plan by Terry Farrell, uh, and that was submitted shortly after the tome was completed. Uh, and uh, Lendlease um, and Quintain used to have a joint venture partnership that was working on the site. Uh, and night dragon took over eight years ago um and i joined the company about five years ago and so we've grown from a business when i joined uh which was probably maybe about 30 or 40 people i think we're now just under 100 uh and that includes uh a development team sales and marketing uh the customer services estates sales team uh and so really infrastructure. So that's working across all kind of elements of the business. Mm -hmm. um, we are, and I, we're just focused on delivering this site. Um, and at the time when I joined, they were looking for uh, someone to kind of head up the design of the, of, of the site in terms of, of the architecture and the interiors. And actually what happened in that process was that um, I joined really to focus on the architecture the master planning uh, and the public realm. And a colleague of mine, Jane Lawrence, joined uh, as head of the interiors uh, for the schemes. And she really focuses on, on the interior design aspects of the apartments. Um, and so my role is, is quite broad. I mean, we range, so I focus a lot on the master planning. So I worked closely with Allies and Morrison and continuously on updating the master plan and the work we do on that. And that's it's you know it's, it's a it's a big complex project uh, with engagement with Transport for London at North Greenwich mm. Station, uh, looking at new bus station, the interface with TfL, um, new main central park, which we're currently working on new designs for, all the uh, development plots. Uh, it's obviously the fifteen thousand homes, uh, mixed use. Uh, schemes, the design district, which I think we'll we'll talk about in a bit. So 
the, the it goes from all scales really from right up to uh to so the big master plan down to individual development plots so for example we're currently working on a new new scheme by uh, allies and morrison um uh as well as obviously them doing the master plan we do work with different architects which we'll come on to later uh and uh we did uh a great scheme which was delivered um, last summer called The Tide, which was a scheme by Dillis Cofidio Renfro. So that's a major uh, piece of public realm, which is a, a five kilometer um, sort Where's of running it? track and trail that loops all around the peninsula. So we've delivered right. the first one and a half kilometers of it. And it will, as the peninsula gets developed, more and more pieces get kind of added on. So, so uh, was, was Night Dragon formed specifically for the, all the development work that's going on at the yeah. peninsula? Yes. So, so uh, Henry, Henry Cheng, who uh, from, from Hong Kong, uh, who uh, also heads up New World Development in Hong Kong. Right. It, it's, this is, it's where the, the special purpose vehicle that was set up to deliver this project uh, after he invested in it got it okay so he's so he's he's based in hong kong and they set up that basically. they set up the vehicle and then the team and we we i'm currently talking to you from the peninsula so we our team is, is is fully based here and obviously we work very closely in partnership with the gla they they are also one of the sort of prime primary landholders across the peninsula so we have a very close relationship with the royal borough of, of greenwich with the gla uh to deliver uh, essentially the, the housing on this on this site got it brilliant is does dr cheng come over very often he does yeah he has been well not 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 in the last last 12 months oh, yeah, or so, but yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> he has been over yeah absolutely fantastic and and the 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 project specifically we're going to look at today was the design district can you give us a little bit of background on what on what that is yeah uh, this so is a really interesting aspect it's, of the yeah uh so obviously we are primarily a uh a residential led uh development scheme uh and so we the the projects we've delivered on site up to date we have uh a lot of projects which we delivered i guess um it was from the end of the relationship with quintain and that's a neighborhood on the site on the peninsula called lower riverside uh and I think we've delivered just under 4,000 homes already. Now, those there were schemes in there by uh, DSDHA, CF Muller, Pilbro, uh, uh, and that's that's our sort of our, our existing community of residents that's growing. And then closer to the O2, to the north of the site, we've delivered a scheme with um, SOM, and that's for a thousand uh, that has a thousand homes in it, and that completed just at the end of last year. Uh, and so we have residents there as well. Um, and at the same time, so we obviously, I know we, we had the, the, the public realm scheme with Dillis Cofidio Renfro, which uh, completed last year as, uh, as well. And since 2016, I think, or 17, it's probably the end of 16, we started on the design districts, which is now coming to completion. And that is a district that is, is very close to, to the main square, at Peninsula Square next to the O2. So it's right at the heart of the peninsula. Mm. And it's the first piece of really em employment-focused mixed-use development that we've done on the site. Uh, and for us, it's, uh, it's a really important scheme in that I think it will generate a lot of interest. Obviously, it generates employment, which is brilliant but it becomes a really important piece of placemaking for us, um, which is, a, which I guess not only serves the people who are work there, but also really serves all the residents who are now living on the peninsula as well. And it is a district which is one hectare in size. So it's quite small. It's compact. It's one of the, the few districts that isn't very tall. So a lot of the buildings that we have on the peninsula are tall buildings um, at the moment, the tallest is about 31, I think 31 stories. And in the future, on Meridian Keys, which faces Canary Wharf, we'll have buildings which will go up to about 40 stories. But the maximum height in the, in the design district is five stories. Right. Uh, and that was a height cap that we set in planning, which was uh, linked. So it sits at the top of the park. So the idea, um, which was... Uh, 
when you stand at Greenwich Millennium Village and look north up 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 the existing park, you can see the sort of masts of the of the O2. And it was there to what they what the planners wanted to do was preserve those views. So it, it's quite interesting that a temporary building gets that sort of status, uh, <laughs> you know, in planning terms. Uh, but it, not uncommon, you know. You know, the the the, uh, the Millennium Eye is, you know, is a, was a temporary building. And Eiffel Tower was a temporary building, you know, and they 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 become iconic landmarks. Um, so the district was 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 unique in that sense that it's fully it's it's focused on being low rise. Uh, and what we wanted to do when we set out with the market, it was in the the Allies and Morrison Master Plan in terms of the principles set out around it. And the idea was that it was focused on the creative industries. So when we took over the master plan with Eliza Morrison and reshifted uh, the sort of the focus of the peninsula, um, we wanted the employment really to be focused around the creative industries. And mm. the reason for that is that the O2 is here. So you've got uh, employment focused around entertainment uh, and music uh, and culture. Uh, and you've got Ravensbourne Art College, which is here. So you've got two and a half thousand students who are graduating in the creative industries. Uh, and actually not many stay in the borough. Uh, you know, a lot of them head off the, into, into different boroughs uh, for employment. So that, the idea of being able to retain some of that talent was, was important. And as part of the, that master plan, we were looking at, at the time, at some film studios. And so the, 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 the design district was going to sit in the heart of the peninsula and link these, these, at the time, what looked like kind of disparate elements, but it, it would sort of pull those together. So the, the idea was that you might have um, a CGI company or a set design company or makeup, you know, the, the, the peripheral industries around film might come and locate here. Um, well, actually, what we decided was to bring the design district forward and, and the mayor backed the film studios for Dagenham and, and Redbridge. And so they're, they're moving there. Uh, and we've now refocused that, that area of the master plan and we, we've reworked that again with Allies and Morrison. But the, the, we wanted to bring the design district forward as, as a kind of uh, an important piece of, of, of placemaking to provide mm. value uh, to visitors that come to that come to 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 the to the center of the peninsula and so we had a brief which was uh i guess there were there was sort of a range of principles that 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 came forward and one was that we wanted to attract creatives we wanted to give them a home in zone two that uh, was permanent uh that was affordable uh and it was a place that they would want to come and work in uh, so the affordability piece was key because then going back to the previous conversation or the sort of earlier conversation, that had that set the appraisal, uh, and so that said everything. You know that that meant that we we had sort of target costs for buildings, we had a sort of construction budget that was going to be all driven by making sure that at the end of the project we could charge an affordable uh, rate to our tenants. Um, and then we wanted, so low cost was key. And then we wanted to create an environment which was interesting and immersive, uh, which uh, would people would find exciting to come to and attractive. So if we'd sat down with a development team and said, right, this is what we're going to do, they would have said, right, you're going to build two buildings. Uh, and then you're just going to carve it up in size and we'll make loads of little studios uh, and it will be, you know, that's, that's the cheapest way of doing it. But what it didn't do was create the place aspect uh, and the, the, the elements that are interesting. So we worked with um, uh, Pete Besley and Hannah Corlett, who at the time were, were a practice called Assemblage, now called HNNA. We developed a, a master plan which took on the Allies master plan, but it, it mm. just developed it specifically for the design district. And again, with the principles of developing uh, plots uh, for the for the buildings, which um, would then allow architects to come in a, 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 and work to a brief. And so I guess there was a sort of horizontal aspect in terms of developing the plan and tying it into the existing master plan. And then there was a sort of vertical aspect of thinking about how we would we would create a brief for the buildings. And so we wanted we wanted the district to be creative in the sense that people made stuff. 
Uh, and so we wanted it to be messy and noisy. Uh, 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 and the idea that, you know, you might buy something which had, you know, made in design districts or made on the peninsula. And that was a sort of a thing. And so we thought the ground floors would be workshops. Anything that needed heavy kit machinery would, would go on the ground. And then the floors above would be more open plan and adaptable. So if you were a desk based design practice, it could be an architecture studio or a fashion designer, you, would, you could take a space on one of those floors and it could be a whole office or it could be carved up or uh, it could be turned into a smaller unit. You know, however, we, we, we had much more flexibility in, in those units for different tenants. Yep. And then on the top floors, we were looking at exploring natural light uh, and, and getting uh, studio space, either for photography or painting. Uh, and so creating kind of lantern spaces at, at, at the tops of buildings. How, um, how, how did you, um, how did the, the kind of financial argument for this come about or the business case? Um, and it's, it's interesting that you were saying like if it had been totally led by developers, it would have been a very different, different scheme. Where, where was the initiative to kind of hand it over to creatives or let, let design be such a kind of key part of it? How did that kind of um, uh, meld into the, the business agenda think, of Night Dragon? Um, I think the, we're really fortunate in terms of the way uh, Night Dragon is, is, is run. And I'd say run in the UK. So uh, um, our chief exec, Richard Margrie, uh, and our, one of the directors, Kerry Sibson, are real, um, you know, they, they promote great design and it's embedded in everything we do. And so I think when you have at the top of your business uh, leadership that's really fighting for the value of design and understands yep. the value of design, it means that it's it sort of sits very high up on the agenda when you're starting mm. a project. And so I should say the development team are really supportive <laughs> in terms of helping to make the project come about and thinking about the approach for making it work. Yeah. Um, but I think it meant that we were able to kind of have design as the primary lens when setting out the project and understanding that what we weren't doing was the most efficient piece of design because we have um, 16 buildings in the design districts, not four. Uh, you know, so for example, so we have a lot of facades. Mm. Uh, you know, it is not an efficient way of doing things. Um, but I think there was a buy-in that if we were going to design some big boxes, then it wouldn't be attractive to the people that we wanted to come. And so when you made that case, I think everyone bought into it. Uh, I think, you know, it was, so we have 16 buildings. They've been worked on by eight architects, uh, you know, and so actually saying uh, that's eight architects, eight fees, a lot of coordination, huge amount of admin from client side, you know, that was a challenge to explain. But, you know, once you made your case that you were heard and we, were, and we had the backing of, of the business, we had the backing in Hong Kong, um, to do something that we felt would generate a really special project. And so I think it was always going back to what was the vision. The vision was to create an amazing place, a great neighborhoods, brilliant architecture that was affordable and low cost that could attract the tenants at the end. Uh, and so I think if you keep going back to that, you keep getting, you keep, you kept getting the buy. You know, are we doing the right thing? Are we, are we still trying to, to deliver on what we set out to do? Yeah. Um, so, and I, I think not, not all um, not all company cultures allow you to, to take that risk, and it's a huge risk because you know off, often on residential projects you're building something that you then start to you know you're forward funding it, but you're then starting to set off plan, yeah. And so you're able to sort of to start to 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 essentially recoup the finances for that project. For the design district, it was being built without any anyone signed up, without any tenants, you know, in mind, and it had to be flexible enough to sort of accommodate uh, those. Um, and I, so, I mean, we had these, we had this brief, and we had a, we had a, a we had to commit to a uh, a rent essentially. And so, what we did was we we committed to a rent where we knew we could broadly make it work. At very low cost at 25 pounds a square foot rent and what we did was that was that was averaged across the whole district so we knew that if we had that as a blended rate you could have tenants who were paying 
30 pounds a square foot who would cross subsidize uh, and someone would pay 10 pounds or five pounds. And so we had that flexibility that we right. knew that some of the, the, the workshops, you know, would not be, you know, if they were in a workshop somewhere in East London, they would not be paying 25 quid a square foot. But we also knew that there were some creative industries or creative companies that would be paying more, for example, in Spitalfields or Shoreditch. And so we could, we could have that balance. Uh, and, and so that was fixed. We, we, we fixed on that number to get to really get the project moving. And then we went uh, to try and find some architects uh, to, to, to come on come on board. And again, I think there was quite a lot. We all had, we were sort of, um, we don't do, um, we don't do competitions yeah. uh, on the peninsula. Um, we, we really have a list, uh, and I guess this is part of my role. We have a, a, a trying to talk to, to architects, get to know them, uh, understand the, their sort of their work uh, and what drives them. Uh, and then we hope to be able to marry them to a project that we think that is, is a good fit. Uh, and that way um, we can work together. And we'd much rather we invite people than ask them to have to spend uh, time and money competing on for something that, 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 that they might not, might not get. So um we do do artist artist competitions for, for sort of art and, and public realm stuff, um, but not for the buildings. And so we had a list. We all had different lists, or a few of us had different lists, and then where we had common names where they came, and then there was an argument about about uh, the, the, the 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 last few. But then actually, the first eight people we asked, or nine, including the public realm designers, uh, all said yes. So actually, we never you know we never had to go far down the list. And everyone bought into the project. We asked them, we asked all the practices to buy into the process, to buy into the constraints of the scheme. And I think they all did. Now, one of the reasons to pick that many architects was that we wanted somewhere, uh, we wanted a neighborhood that was going to be very diverse, that was going to look different. And I think uh, while I'm very proud of the projects we do on the peninsula, um, that it's, I think it's challenging creating a, a, a neighbourhood. The projects we do are kind of incremental. We do a, a one plot that will take you know three, four years, and uh, and then the next one, and the next one. Mm. And this was creating something much quicker uh, in terms of 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 this neighbourhood, all the buildings in that space of time. And I know it's a, it's a dense little neighbourhood, but but it's a lot to deliver all of those yeah. pieces at once. And I think often if you ask people a piece of city that they like, they are more likely to, to, to reference an established neighbourhood. So they might say a, a pocket of Camden or a street in Southwark or, oh, no, there's an amazing square in Notting Hill or, you know, Clerkenwell uh, Square, or, I don't, there's, there's Clerkenwell Green. or they, they'll, they'll pick something usually, I think, within a, in an established neighbourhood. Mm. And so the idea was in the design process was how could we try and replicate something like that in a, in a modern setting, doing it all from scratch. And I think that we thought that cities are, um, are messy places uh, and um, uh, and full of different styles of architecture. And uh, we, sort of, we talk about having a wit and a bit of mess. And so we wanted to try and replicate that in the design process. So the, the 16 builders, uh, there's four buildings clustered in around four courtyards. And those are sort of working courtyards. And then there's a main square in the middle of, of the district. Uh, and a pro, um, a sk- um, Neil's Yard is a, is a good example, Yes, I think, of, of a precedent where you go through a little narrow passageway, it opens up into the square, and then you look around and it's full of different colours and, uh, and kind of st- styles and, and uh, you know, bits that have been added on. And, uh, but it's very characterful. So we picked... Um, eight architects uh, who each had a pair of buildings, never next to each other, always in a different part of the district. So they were never neighboring. And when we asked them all to work blind, uh, and in that sense, we knew that <laughs> some of them would be friends. And so we'd talk to each other, but we said, we, what we'd like you to do is not talk to your neighbor, not talk to the, the guy next, uh, the, 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 the practice next to you, but just go and do your thing, work in isolation. And what we had as a, as a team structure it was incredibly intense. We had we had a, the, the client team, 
Uh, and then we had a supporting team of, of uh, all the other consultants and they were the same across all the buildings. So m and &E, structures, uh, uh, accessibility, all of that was one team. We would sort of hmm. sit like in a kind of crit and uh, we had four architects one week, four architects the next week, next week. And, and then so that, and it, that so the design process went on for a couple of months and they would come and present mm -hmm. to the team and we had a model and then put them little cardboard models on the model. And so we knew what was emerging and we knew the, the neighbors, you know, the schemes. And so, uh, but what we wanted was their different styles. So we wanted the idea that you could walk into the district, you'd have a moment where you go, wow, look at that, that's my, that's the one, that's the building that I love. Or you go, whoa, not sure about that one. I much prefer that. You're allowed to have a Marmite moment. And we had that on the client side. So, you know, we had, you know, we had, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Kerry, for example, go, oh, I'm not sure about what they're doing there. And I go, oh, I love it. And then on the next scheme, I'd be like, oh, not sure about that. She'd go, no, no, that's, that's brilliant. We've got to keep that. So I guess we were engineering the designs in a sense and, and aware of what was emerging, mm. but also that there was a sort of, there was a, there was a different styles across the districts and, and that that would create this slightly, this, this sort of sense of, of wit and mess and character. And, um, but on the landscape, a single hand. So the idea that you could have different buildings landing, but the landscape had a, a sort of common language across the piece. And I think you find that when you, you know, if you walk around the great states of London, uh, you know, you know when you're kind of, you know, you know when you're on Grosvenor's land. You, you kind of get that sense. And and so we wanted that sense that you you felt it was a neighbourhood, yeah. From from the kind of the, the public realm, um, but you could have these different buildings. Uh, and different aesthetics uh you know so we have for example uh and i realize i haven't mentioned any of the architects yet uh, so um well, how, uh, how, how did you come up with the list of architects how did you how did you choose them and of, and of um, course it's, it's a real interesting pedigree of architects that you've that you've gone for as well i kind of i think i think for me it was often architects that you might not have associated with a big read gen development scheme um, in that sort of sense. Uh, architects that we felt worked in that space and would suit the projects and sort mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, had done things which of interest. So I think, for example, if I took, you know, uh, 6A, you know, done a lot of work with uh, galleries, uh, you know, they work with artists, um, we, uh, Barazzi Vega had done a, again, gallery and, and again, had worked with a lot of artists. Uh, Moll had done uh, interesting projects around CL, both their buildings are CLT. So we knew that they kind of had worked again on some really cool spaces uh, in Cambridge that would fit, that would sort of fit the bill. And I guess they were people that as individuals within the office we wanted to work with and we admired their work. Uh, and that we felt, so when we spoke to them all, we, we wanted to see if there was a fit. And I think there was. Um, so that was, I guess that, that, it was, that was the approach. It was nothing more than, than really that we were excited by their work. Yeah. Uh, and that we felt that we did feel that there was a different uh, style. I mean, interestingly, I, I, I think they've all experimented and I, I'm not sure you would necessarily associate the building with the architect that they've done, uh, in a sense. I think some of those are quite surprising. You know, the mole buildings are uh, core 10 and, and this sort of, um, uh, this dichroic paint sort of finish on, on their other building, I think is quite a surprising, for me, quite a surprising uh, aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, it's, they're brilliant, it, it looks super cool. Uh, I think the Sel Selgas Cano buildings are, are very much of their style and piece. Uh, six A's, I think, uh, are, for me, feel like, uh, I guess they were working on those at the same time as they were delivering Milton Keynes. Uh, and you can sort of feel that there's a transition and an influence from some of that work. So uh, from, a, from that perspective, I think there's, you can, you can, for me, you can make out where they've experimented and been different or where, you know, I think you'd recognize architecture zero zero's buildings as being kind of a uh, yeah. something that, that they've done. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it was just uh, it's, it was a lucky mix. And I, I guess in a sense. I love it. I love it. Um, uh, with with what what made 
successful relationships with each of the different architects. Um, and, and and also from from like your from the developer side, what's you know, what are the key elements to having that kind of successful working relationship? I think um, I think the buy-in of the project. Well, there's a couple of things that uh, everyone bought into the process, and we spent a lot of time at the outset having meetings together before we started design, trying to explain where we were coming from why we picked so many architects, what were the principles behind the project? Again, you know, this idea of steering that vision, getting the buy-in and really emphasizing. I think sometimes what, what we experience on, on some of the residential schemes is that you have a process which begins and the architect, you know, and we'll say that there are constraints around a project, but often will then be sold, not sold, but will be presented a scheme that, it, that sits that pushes the boundaries and sits outside the budget. And what that does is it's, you get an interesting element where it, it pushes you out of your comfort zone as a client where you love a scheme, but can you afford it? Can you take elements of it and then drive it and, and find something that, that works for both parties, that meets the ambition of the vision, um, but also sits within the original brief at the outset. Mm. And I think we were really clear about the brief and about the, that end user and about the rent, and about embracing this low cost of the budget. That was that was key. We were then able to, I think, having a shared consultant team behind the architects was really important. So, for example, where there's uh, where we could, we specified common elements. So everyone has the same lift, and also the buildings are pretty stripped to basics. They are they are naturally ventilated. Uh, I think there's only two which are close to the bus station, which needs some mechanical uh, ventilation. So they're shallow floor plates. Uh, there's a single core, which means, you know, the main stair is the, also the fire escape stair. Yeah. Uh, things like um, the uh, ironmongery, the sanitary wear, we picked the same where we could. So we could find those buying efficiencies with the contractor later on. Um, so it really became about, I guess the structure uh, and then also about the facades, they're shell and core. They're pretty basic. They're going to be bashed around. Um, I think the architects all want to take photographs before the tenants move in and start bashing them around. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, that we, they bought, they bought into that idea and that we were able to share knowledge across the project. So if there was something happening on one scheme in terms of structures, we were able to feed that into another design team and learn and where there was things that we learned they could be shared and actually um slack became a very useful tool i think for the whole design team they were everyone was on it and so there were discussions around you know fire around egress around the sanitary way around those things and they could dip in and out of those conversations once that design development phase really got going um and those so they were able to to feed off that the other thing that's important i think is that now that we're on site and we're you know we're completing in the next month or two uh, is that all the architects were novated. So Ardmore, our contractor, novated everyone on. And I think that was a big ask. And that was something that was really important to us was not that we had a set of designs that then one executive architect was going to oversee, but that all the architects stayed on to complete their buildings on site. Uh, and I think that's been very valuable in terms of keeping the design and keeping the, the value, keeping those the elements that were important as it's gone through a, a design mm. and build contract as well. Um, so I think those were key. I mean, we did have, you know, we had difficult moments. I remember uh, at, at the beginning of the project with Architecture 00, we had one of the development managers was sort of saying, right, you've got too much circulation in your building. There's not enough net rentable area inside it. It's not efficient. It's not working. You know, you've got to go and solve it. And then David Saxby and, and, and Linton Pepper came back, you know, two weeks later. Uh, and they had the, all their circulation space outside the building. The building was now wrapped in a, in a mesh wrapper. Uh, and they said, right, there you go. All the external, all this, all the circulations outside, everything that's in a wall is rentable. There you go. You know, <laughs> and so actually that, you know, that pressure to respond, uh, to that to that issue for, for the development team created a unique piece of design which now has a basketball court on the roof and 
external circulation that takes that can take the public up without having to go inside the building. Uh, and so there were lots of great design solutions that came mm. out of the process. And I think there were moments of serendipity as well, whereby you know, we have two buildings by 6A where the facades are, are sort of chamfered back, they lean back at an angle. And on one of them, Baroxy Vegas building was coming up next to it. And they had a huge picture window, five and a half meter high space at the top. And if, if um, which was sort of sitting here now, if 6A's building had been upright, it would have been blocking that view, but they didn't know that this moment had been created where you could see down the, the side of the building, of the 6A building and, and past it. So, how, so how, did, how did that work in terms of, of planning of all these buildings going in? Were they, I'm assuming they were all going in in separate applications one no, by one. No, it, it all went in on, under one application. So we did the application right. for the whole neighbourhood. Uh, so we we got to, we 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 had that we we got to stage three stage went in at stage kind of two and a half three but it all went in as one application right okay um, and so I think and I think that's the thing is an interesting aspect of the projects I guess is is for the, is the architects were working on their buildings and so they were just they you know they're focused on delivering their scheme and and they got these two buildings and all the issues that come about of just doing two buildings and even though they're pretty small they all have complex issues on site and yeah. and so they're very focused on those but actually we were always looking at 16 buildings and delivering all of that district and that whole neighborhood and so that that means you, your your lens and your look uh, your when you're looking at that project trying to deliver the whole piece as the client you were focused on a, on a very you had a, a sort of a, a different focus than just thinking about delivering two buildings um and so that sometimes you were looking at having, you know, those discussions around the value of the whole project, not two individual buildings. So, uh, so, so, yeah. how, so how does how does Night Night Dragon um, determine, or what are the kind of criteria for like kind of determining whether this was a success or not? Uh, both, when, both, we get, both, when we both have, when we have loads of when we have <laughs> loads of tenants in, um, <laughs> well, look. The scheme that we the scheme has a very long term, uh, a, a sort of long term business plan, and I think that's because we had to because we're wanting to keep those rents down. Yeah. And so, um, what was key is, is getting people on the site of a, of a, a new demographic in the sense that they're not just res, not just residents, yeah. but that we have that turnover of, of that you get in a city. You've got people who come to work, people who live, people who visit. Uh, and so we're trying to, you know, we're, we're creating a new piece of city. You want that diversity and mix uh, of uses uh, and visitors. So that's, that's a really important part of, of, the, of the project and, and how it sits in the wider context of the peninsula. The key for us is that people come and take spaces. And so we have uh, one tenant is already in one of the buildings, the Barozzi building, uh, Barozzi Vega's first building, has been taken on by uh, Ravensbourne, who have turned it into, uh, they're calling it the Institute of Creativity. And it is their, their new postgraduate offer, as well as their sort of commercial wing of the college and the sort of business incubator. Um, and so they've, they, they're, they're in. And over the next few months, we've got other tenants moving in. So we have uh, tenants, and I can't really at this stage talk about names, but we have uh, uh, actually I can mention one, which is a, a company called Concept Kicks, who are uh, a, a sort of a, a trainer design business. We have um, music bid companies, so music A and R. We have uh, I think a landscape design company that's interested. We have two dance companies. Um, uh, there's uh, two companies in health and well-being, uh, ch two charities, uh, a, pr uh, a printing agency. Mm. Um, so again, that there we've got tenants coming in. The success for us is that it's full. Brilliant. The success for us is that people stay, uh, uh, that people come and visit. There's a food market in the centre, which is one of the Stalgas Cano buildings, and that has six food food stalls within it. Uh, it's a, quite an unusual, exciting building where the roof can open up and it's got a sort of lots of biophilia, a typical kind of Sargas Cano approach to sort of filling their, uh, uh, filling their, their building with, with plants. Um, uh, and I think the important thing that was that because it's a permanent district, 
one of the converse, one of the things that, that that came through lots of conversations with creative industries was that they what they didn't want was have to, was to continue to have to move you know so there's a lot of schemes i think where there's temporary occupation of buildings before they're developed and then that creative community has moved on to another spot where they find the next place to go so the idea that actually they could come and really set up a business and work and not have to worry mm. about leaving their lease two years later or that they were going to be moved on so i think that's that's important and i think that it becomes embedded in part of the identity of the place um uh, so that's, I think that's the success. I think, um, you know, a vibrant, a vibrant piece, a vibrant neighbourhood, which residents like and workers like, will be a sign of success because it means that people will be there paying rent and people will be coming to visit and it will be busy. So then it'll provide new amenities, provide uh, new opportunities for people, new things to do, uh, which is what great cities are all about. Yeah. What, what happens after Design District is all fully opened um, and Night Dragon's next and your next set of projects? Does the project kind of, is it going to be like a, um, your, your involvement with it's going to be obviously long-term, but are there new developments on the horizon or so, new, new parts of um, London to yeah. be developed? Uh, well, uh, so there's enough. There's a lot to come on the peninsula. So um, we've got another residential plot which we're submitting for planning uh, at the moment, um, and that's part of the existing master plan. Uh, and we have a new bus station to build. We have uh, in the, once the, the the new master plan. So we have a, a revision to the master plan, which is currently uh, in with with Greenwich. Once that's um, once that's done, there's a there's I mean there's a whole range of projects which go from further employment space to homes to hotels, um, the rest of the infrastructure that connects to our district uh, energy centre. So uh, I mean, like I said at the beginning, we we're building over fifteen thousand homes, and we're about four thousand in. So you, you know, we still got. We've still got a way, a to, go. way to go. Yeah. We've got a little way to go. There's, and there's further neighbourhoods to come. So um, the design district is a really important piece, but then it's just, you know, we're, we're, we're already working on the next bits. And the idea is that we connect it all up as quickly as we can. And you've got an amazing new uh, place to live on the peninsula with one and a half miles of river frontage. Uh, you know, and I think in a funny way, it, it's the given everything that people have gone through uh, over the course of the last 12 months, um, you suddenly, you know, the things that are important here, you know, in terms of having that, having access to the river, having access to views, having access to open space, um, being connected into the city, you know, and this, you can get into uh, Bond Street in about 20 minutes, you know, on the Jubilee, we're, we're really well connected in public transport, but to have a place that, you can also access that outdoor amenity yeah. and have space to to sort of enjoy uh, enjoy the river, enjoy the, the sort of main park. Suddenly, all those things sort of start to really make even more sense than they did before. Um, so there's lots of wonderful qualities here, which I think are going to stand the peninsula in really good stead in terms of it, you know, keeping on kind of growing over the over the coming years. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. And that's a perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. Yeah. So it, it's been a really, really great insight in terms of, you know, your, your career, your work, um, Night Dragon and how they've been developing the entire peninsula. Um, and yeah, and how you've been working with architects. So thank you very much. Well, it's been, been a pleasure talking about it. As I was, you spend so much time, uh, you know, do it working on projects with your head down. So it's nice to kind of lift your head back up and and uh, and talk about it. Uh, so thanks for having me. My pleasure. Excellent. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment, and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment 
except to help you be unstoppable.